Good to have you with us. This is Arirang News, live from our studio in Seoul. I'm Na Hyun Gang. In what could be seen as the extension of an olive branch to North Korea, South Korea has proposed holding inter-Korean dialogue in the new year. Hwang Sung-hee has our top story. In a surprise move towards the year's end, South Korea proposed Monday to meet with North Korea for talks sometime in January. The Presidential Committee for Unification Preparation officially proposed talks on issues of mutual interest between South and North Korea. We hope to heal the wounds of war-separated families before the Lunar New Year holiday. South Korean Unification Minister Ryu gil said the talks would center on the issues discussed by the Unification Preparatory Committee this year and its plans for next year, which marks the 70th year of the division of the Korean Peninsula. Some plans include expanding people-to-people -people exchanges through sporting events such as a soccer match between the two Koreas. The committee also plans to work towards holding family reunions on a regular basis and allowing for the exchange of letters. While some doubt a positive response from North Korea, saying the regime was never a fan of President Park's Unification Preparation Committee, others remain hopeful. There are members of the committee that have visited the North. They say North Korea's assessment of the Unification Preparatory Committee has not been positive or negative. We hope North Korea accepts our proposal. Analysts say Pyongyang will want to make some progress with Seoul in time for the 70th year of their division next year, and that Kim Jong-un will likely express his willingness to do so in his New Year's speech on January 1st. Hwang Sang-hee, Arirang News. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan will be able to share military intelligence regarding North Korea more easily starting today. Although indirectly, the agreement gives Seoul and Tokyo unprecedented access to each other's defense intelligence. Kim Hyun-bin reports. Nuclear bombs and intercontinental ballistic missiles that can reach the continent of the United States. North Korea has made substantial progress in its weapons of mass destruction in recent years, posing a threat to the region and the world. To that, a memorandum of understanding between South Korea, the United States, and Japan took effect Monday with North Korea's nuclear and missile threats in mind. It changes the way the three nations exchange their defense information. Before the agreement, Seoul and Tokyo shared their intelligence only with Washington. The MOU means that Washington will now be able to relay that information to Korea or Japan with the consent of the country providing that information. For South Korea, that means better access to Tokyo's advanced surveillance capabilities, which include airborne warning and control systems, and Aegis destroyers. By gaining access to Japan's state-of-art surveillance techniques, we are enhancing our capabilities. The three nations have plans to sign a similar agreement in 2012 but that was scrapped due to opposition from the Korean public and lawmakers. To avoid pushback this time around, the agreement will scale down to the vice minister level. It also states that the U.S. will act as a mediator when sharing the intelligence, as opposed to the previous plans, which included direct information sharing between Seoul and Tokyo. There's speculation this could lead to the phasing in of a U.S. missile defense system on the Korean peninsula. The defense ministry says the two are not linked adding that South Korea is planning to deploy its own Korea air and missile defense system by the early 2020s. Kim Hyun-bin, Arirang News. And on this last Monday of 2014, President Park Geun-hye checked on the government's key tasks for the year. The heads of government ministries and agencies briefed the president on how much progress they've made on a total of 38 projects, then discussed ways to better carry out the initiatives in the coming year. The Office for Government Policy Coordination gave itself a pat on the back for moving forward with the administration's four major policy goals, such as spurring the local economy by innovating the economic system. The Finance Ministry reported on tangible outcomes from efforts to reform public institutions and improve welfare for the elderly. 
Now, the search for the missing Air Asia flight resumed as the sun rose on Monday. More than 160 people were on board that flight. So far, we are not getting any reports of wreckage being found. For the latest, here's Connie Lee. As search operations continue for any sign of missing Air Asia Flight 8501, Indonesia's chief rescue official now says they believe the plane is on the bottom of the sea. Our evaluation of the coordinates that we received suggests it is underwater, so our presumption now is that the aircraft is under the sea. Currently, ships, planes and helicopters are being used to find the missing aircraft after search operations were suspended Sunday night. Air traffic control officials say the plane went missing Sunday at 7.24 a.m. local time after one of the pilots had requested to fly at a higher altitude to avoid storm clouds. The Air Asia flight was flying from the Indonesian city of Surabaya to Singapore when it went missing 40 minutes into flight above the Java Sea with 162 passengers on board. Of the people on board, 155 of them are Indonesian, with one British, Malaysian and Singaporean passenger and three people from Korea. According to Korea's foreign ministry, the Korean nationals are a couple in their 30s and their 11-month-old daughter. On Monday, the ministry also said it plans to send a surveillance plane as early as late Tuesday to help in the search and rescue operation. At a makeshift crisis center in Indonesia Surabaya Airport, more than 100 distraught relatives wait for news of their loved ones. We are very surprised and very sad. Our grandchild was going to Singapore for a holiday, but the accident happened. Air Asia is a Malaysia-based budget airline that travels to 88 destinations, mostly in Southeast Asia. Connie Lee, Arirang News. Well, Malaysia is suffering from some of its worst flooding in decades. At least 10 people have been killed, while over 160,000 are estimated to have been displaced. Local media report that the floods in the worst affected state, Kelantan, are starting to recede, but many are still feared to be stranded. Prime Minister Najib Razak, who is facing public criticism for his absence during the flooding, said extra funding would be made for the victims. Thailand, in the meantime, also declared declared disaster zones in eight of its southern provinces after floods killed at least 14 people there since mid-December. It's been reported that more than 180,000 households were affected and nearly 8,000 people displaced in the country. Now, rescue operations continue for hundreds of passengers stranded on a burning ferry off the coast of Greece. Officials say more than 200 passengers have now been saved, but there are still more than 250 people aboard the ferry anxiously waiting to be rescued. For this report, here is Shin Zemin. Italian and Greek military and Coast Guard officials are struggling to get hundreds of passengers off the burning Italian flag Norman Atlantic ferry that sits stranded and billowing smoke off the coast of Greece. Battling high winds and choppy waves, Coast Guard officials have a daunting task on their hands and it's becoming a race against time given to fire and the inclement weather conditions. At least one person has been confirmed dead and two of the rescued suffered injuries. Passengers have been pulled from the smothering vessel, though. The Italian Navy says little over 200 of the some 480 people on the ferry had been airlifted to safety since Sunday night local time. However, people left on the ship looked likely to face a night of uncertainty and fear. The blaze is believed to have broken out early Sunday morning in the lower deck garage of the vessel. Describing it as one of the most complicated rescue operations ever undertaken, the Greek shipping minister said bad weather conditions and strong winds have hampered attempts to get everyone off the ferry. Some 10 merchant ships in the area have been assisting rescue efforts with some transporting dozens of passengers away from the burning vessel. Local authorities say rescued passengers are being treated for dehydration and hypothermia. The condition of the ferry prior to this fire is also being called into question. Reports say the last inspection of the ferry found six deficiencies, including a malfunctioning fire door, as well as missing emergency lights and defective watertight doors. Despite the safety issue, the European Maritime Safety Agency says none of them were severe enough to keep the ship in port. Since I'm in, Arirang News. 
The longest war in American history has officially come to an end. The U.S. and its NATO allies held a ceremony Sunday at their military headquarters in Kabul, formally concluding its combat mission in Afghanistan. President Barack Obama hailed the end of more than 13 years of military operations there, saying the international effort had resulted in destroying al-Qaeda's core leadership and brought justice to Osama bin Laden. He also honored the more than 2,200 U.S. servicemen and women who died in the war. About 13-thousand foreign troops, mostly Americans, will remain in Afghanistan, helping train local security forces and assisting them in counterterrorism operations. The confidence of Korean manufacturers dropped this month. The Bank of Korea says the Business Survey Index, or BSI, for the manufacturing sector in December dropped two points from a month earlier to 73. To give you some context, the reading below 100 means more businesses are pessimistic about the economy than those that are optimistic. Now, the business sentiment of exporters went up, though, as their ability to pay improved thanks to the exchange rate and falling oil prices. That index rose by four points from a month earlier to 76 this month, while the number slipped by five points for domestic-focused companies. The influence of Korea's top 10 conglomerates on the nation's economy diminished last year. That's according to Chebol.com, which says combined sales of the top 10 conglomerates dropped by about 820 million U.S. dollars in 2013 compared to the year before. However, data showed that Samsung and Hyundai recorded higher sales and net income last year, with their combined sales reaching $182 billion to account for about 4.5% of all sales by Korean companies. Market watchers are worried that wealth is being concentrated in a few leading exporters threatening balanced growth. They say Today, the government needs to come up with measures to boost the overall competitiveness of Korean firms. Now, there is renewed interest in Korea's biotechnology industry since the sector is managing quite well despite the sluggish economic recovery. Data from the Ministry of Trade, Industry and Energy shows that output grew more than 5% in 2013 from the year before to more than 7.5 trillion won or roughly 6.8 billion U.S. dollars. For the past five years, the industry has expanded nearly 9% on average every year. Now, the production of biofood and biomedical products took up almost 80% of the industry's total output. The amount of money poured into research and development went up more than 15% in 2013 from a year earlier. And Korea is set to deploy a new mobile network service soon. The country's largest telecommunications operators, SK Telecom and KT Corporation, say they are commercializing an ultra-high-speed three-band LTEA service. Now, that technology will enable users to download a movie in less than 30 seconds. That's four times faster than the existing LTE service. However, that service will only be available to people with a Samsung Galaxy Note 4 device and only in certain parts of the country where at least three audio frequencies are available. The operators say they will be working on expanding availability throughout next year. SK Hynix is a Korean company and also one of the key movers and shakers in the world's highly lucrative memory chip industry now, but it was a very different story a decade ago. Our Hwang Ji-hye tells us about one of the most remarkable turnarounds in Korea's business history. 
For three straight quarters this year, SK Hynix reported over 1 trillion won, or roughly 900 million U.S. dollars in operating profit. In the third quarter, it earned $30 for every $100 of sales, meaning it was more profitable than Apple in terms of operating profit margin. So, what's driving the company's robust growth recently? Take a look. The memory chip industry is all about adding a ton of a memory storage onto a tiny semiconductor. That includes DRAM chips for computers and flash chips used in smartphones and digital cameras. So, the name of the game is miniaturization technology and an efficient manufacturing process. NSK Hynix, the world's second largest chip maker, excels in reducing production costs. Basically, uh, DRAM is a kind of commodity. So uh, just to be a low-cost producer is uh, the most important thing. Basically, the, during the last like around 30 years, Hynix, uh, SK Hynix remained uh, as a uh, low-cost pr producer. Industry experts say the company's survival instinct has led to engineering innovations that pushed production costs down. When SK Hynix was going through hard times in the past, it wasn't able to invest in facilities, so it had to operate its factories with very little money. But it was back then when the company accumulated its know-hows. So in terms of production efficiency, it has become the number one. Established in 1983 as Hyundai Electronics, the company was pushed to the brink of collapse both in the wake of the 1997 Asian financial crisis and in the 2008 global financial crisis. The debt-laden company also suffered from years of a cutthroat game of slashing prices played out by more than 20 memory chip makers. In 2001, its creditors forced it into a debt workout program. The seemingly never-ending story of financial trouble ended when SK Group, one of Korea's three largest conglomerates, took it over in 2012 and renamed it SK Hynix. With the help of its new deep-pocketed parent, the company could aggressively invest in the latest production facilities as well as research, while the rest of the industry players were cutting back. Now the business environment for SK Hynix seems positive with Samsung Electronics and Micron Technology of the U.S. remaining as the company's only rivals. The demand for memory chips is also growing thanks to the ever-evolving smartphone industry. Of course, a peaceful cohabitation by the three powers could end if the industry leader, Samsung, aggressively increases its market share or if newcomers decide to enter the market. For the foreseeable future, however, SK Hynix is poised to enjoy profits. Hwang Jie, Arirang News. The Korean movie Ode to My Father, set in Busan's Gukje Market, has sold more than 4 million tickets in less than two weeks. And what's interesting is that the popularity of the film is propelling the popularity of the market in real life. Park ji has this story. As its title suggests, Ode to My Father tells a story of a typical father from Korea's older generation through the main character, Tok Su. After growing up during the Korean War, tok -soo later gives up on attending college to support his younger siblings and heads to Germany in the 1960s to earn money as a dispatched miner, then to Vietnam as an engineer during the Vietnam War. After some time, tok -soo finally opens up his own shop at Gukje Market, the largest traditional market in the southern poor city of Busan. The popularity of the film has led to a resurgence in interest in the market, which now houses more than 1,500 small shops. The market usually draws in 20 to 30,000 people during the week and some 50,000 on the weekends. But those numbers have more than doubled since Ode to My Father was released on December 17th. Many of those coming through are young people who want to see the setting of the film for themselves. Some are also looking to connect to the generation of men who lived through the Korean War of 1950s and its aftermath. 
Kukje Market opened in 1946 and began to thrive during the war as it served as a central market among refugees who fled to Korea's southern port city of Busan. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. And speaking of the Korean War, it has left the peninsula divided in two with soldiers serving on the front lines. They cannot let their guards down even for a second, but a cutting-edge surveillance system implemented recently aims to lessen the burden on them a bit. For the story, here's Polly. As soon as irregular movements are detected near the central front line, every soldier in the unit is dispatched to their respective positions. Soldiers stand at the ready while receiving information on an enemy's location from the control room. This is a general outpost or GOP scientific guard system which was implemented early this year. The cutting-edge cameras survey the area around the clock and sound an alarm when even the slightest movement near the ceasefire line is detected. The system has taken off some of the burden on soldiers and enabled the military to reinforce its operational capabilities. Members in our unit are battling out bone-chilling cold weather while paying full attention to the GOP security operation. As part of the Defense Ministry's drive to reform military culture, soldiers serving in general units can now keep in touch with family and friends online. They can also use their spare time for self-improvement activities like learning a foreign language or reading books. The military plans to strengthen the GOP scientific guard system within all frontline units next year so they are fully prepared for a possible enemy provocation while keeping the nation safe. Paul Yi, Arirang News. Hello and happy Monday. I'm Kim Bo Kyung with your weather updates. We got off to a mild start to the week. It's currently about 7 degrees here in Seoul, which is about 5 degrees higher compared to yesterday. Warm air from the west has led to milder temperatures, but has brought fine dust from China along with it. So that, along with cloudy skies and fog, is limiting visibility on the roads. Also, dry weather advisories continue to stick around on the eastern coastline, so humidity levels in parts of Kang the province are down at 28 percent, so make sure to drink sufficient amounts of water and be on the lookout for starting fires. The finest level is at 133 micrograms per cubic meter over on Pengyong Island, which is about three times the normal levels. Plus, Seoul is seeing about three times, two twice that is, twice the normal levels of fine dust. So those with respiratory problems should keep that in mind before heading outdoors. Many of you may be wondering how we'll wrap up the last couple of days of 2014. The warm winter weather will continue before snow or showers fall on Wednesday. And it looks like this will lead to a drop in numbers with morning lows plunging to minus 10 degrees on New Year's Day. So it looks like we'll start off the new year with brisk cold weather. On to the readings. Seoul will peak at 7, Daegu 9, Gwangju 9 as well, while Busan jumps to 11. Moving on to other Places Jeju makes it to 10, Tokyo hits 8, Mount Kumgang remains colder at minus 4. Those are the updates we're following at this hour, and here's a look at the international weather. And that's it from us at this hour from me and the rest of the team in Seoul. Thanks for staying with us. More news coming up at 6 p.m. Korea time.